Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome to today's exciting event organized as part of the Sydney um, Asian Art Series. My name is Peyvan Firuze. I'm lecturer of Islamic art history at the University of Sydney. I'm also one of the co-conveners of the Sydney Asian Art Series and a committee member of Viz Asia. And my job today is to welcome you on behalf of Viz Asia the Australian Institute of Asian Culture and Visual Arts at the Art Gallery of New South Wales, Sydney. Sydney Asian Art Series is a joint project co-presented and co-sponsored by the Power Institute of the University of Sydney and with Asia at the Art Gallery of New South Wales, and is a program that plays a crucial role in cultivating a better understanding of Asian art and culture in academia, in the glam sector, and among the public in Australia and across the world, which is one of the missions of Viz Asia. Today, we are very fortunate to have Yale Rice returning to the series for a second event with, a, um, with two other uh, panelists, uh, whom you'll hear about in a second after her stimulating talk last week. A very warm welcome to all of our panelists and all of you attending. And I'm going to hand it over to Olivia Krischer, the convener of this lecture series, to introduce today's event and our panelists. Thank you, Pevand. Um, and a big thanks to Visasia. Um, as you've just heard, Pevand wears many hats and is very much involved in the series um, from various angles. So my name is Olivier Krischer. It's my pleasure to welcome you as convener um, of the Sydney Asian Art Series along with Pevan uh, and also Alex Birchmore who I've been working with on the collection theme this year and um, Yvonne Lowe. I would like to begin by acknowledging and paying my respects to the Gadigal and Wangal people of the Eora Nation on whose unceded and sovereign lands I live and work and am speaking from today. Since 2017, the Sydney Asian Art Series has, has been presented by the Power Institute at the University of Sydney uh, in partnership with the Art Gallery of South Wales and with the generous support of Viz Asia. Welcome to this roundtable on the subject of art history and the digital, which will be led by our second speaker in the series, Dr. Yale Rice. Um, and each year, the series invites four scholars to share their research around a timely theme in, in Asian art history. And you can find actually most of these talks on the Power Publications website online. Uh, this year marks the first in, in what is a three year research agenda that will be looking at collection, community and care under the collective title of Kura, uh, which you can see on the uh, slide behind me. Collection has been the theme therefore of um, 2023. Yale gave an excellent talk on hierarchy, bias and the museum database last week. Um, which will be available online and we'll be sharing a link for that during uh, the roundtable today in case you missed it. With each speaker, we also develop a second event that's typically collaborative, collegial, and often deals with uh, work in progress or a particularly timely question for the field. Uh, so today's roundtable was developed um, from questions that Yale felt were really pressing to uh, address, namely the issues of the digital, its influence and impact, not only on art collections and art history, but also pedagogy, what as art historians, we need to be learning, teaching and thinking about. The format today is that each speaker will give a brief introduction to contextualize their own work. Um, and this will be followed by a panel discussion and then a Q&A session. So please do post your questions at any time in the Q&A window, which can be accessed, uh, should be able to be accessed uh, via a Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please try to keep your questions as brief and concise and direct as possible. Um, I imagine there'll be many questions, and so this will help us read and respond more quickly uh, so we don't miss any of them, hopefully, along the way. It's now my pleasure to introduce our distinguished panel who are joining from three different time zones around the world, which um, is already amazing. So a very warm thanks to their generosity in finding the time to make this possible. Um, and also I know that much of our audience is also joining from many different places. So thank you for joining today. Firstly, uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Yale Rice, our second Sydney Asian Art Series Scholar for the year. Uh, she is Associate Professor of Art History and Asian Languages and Civilizations at Amherst College. 
uh, Massachusetts. She specializes in the art and architecture of South Asia, Central Asia and Iran, with a particular focus on manuscripts and other portable arts of the 15th through 18th centuries. Between 2009 and 2012, she also held the position of assistant curator of Indian and Himalayan art at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Um, I'm not going to go into each of our panelists' many publications today uh, in the interest of time, but I do um, suggest that that will be available on their bi uh, personal biographies online. It's also my great pleasure to welcome Professor Nancy Ulm, who is Associate Director for Research and Knowledge Creation at the Getty Research Institute. Her research program focuses on art, architecture, and material culture around the Indian Ocean, the Red Sea, and the Arabian Peninsula with a focus on trade and cross-cultural exchange in the early modern era. Um, and I should also say that this is a welcome back uh, because uh, we were delighted to host Nancy as um, a speaker in the 2018 Sydney Asian Art Series. Um, and you can find her talk around aromatic gifts of the late 17th and early 18th century Indian Ocean um, online as an, as an audio file um, in the series. So please um, do have a look at that uh, if you missed it. And we're also delighted to be joined today by Deep, Dr. Deepti Murali, who is Research Assistant Professor at the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media at George Mason University. But today she's joining us from India, where she's currently carrying out some research. So her work focuses on decorative arts of 18th and 19th century South India in particular examining networked histories of production circulation um, and the use of wooden ivory objects from southwestern India and textiles, cotton textiles in particular from southeastern India globally. She currently manages uh, a number of digital public humanities projects, carries out digital art history research um, for some uh, key projects that I think she'll be introducing today as well. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to, um, to Yale. Uh, who, with my warm, warm thanks for making this roundtable possible. Thank you, Yale, over to you. Thanks so much, Olivier. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm going to get us started, but I, maybe I'll ask Nancy and Dipti to uh, turn on their cameras so that the three of us seem to be here together. We are here together. Uh, I'm, I'm really, really delighted to be joined by um, Dipti and Nancy. Um, for this topic, which, as Olivier mentioned, um, seemed to me, to us, to be especially, especially urgent. Uh, the digital, of course, uh, permeates and mediates every aspect of our lives today. I mean, certainly uh, is integral to the work that each of us as art historians, curators, teachers, administrators, librarians, and so on, um, that we do from our smartphones to uh, everything to um, VR to database searches and so on. Um, and in that the digital carries the potential to radically transform the way that we do the work that we do, the way that we teach, the way that we think uh, about the world and see the world. Um, but there are of course, the risks that it could pose. And um, so that's where the urgency I think comes in. And the reason I wanted to have this conversation here um, and in other fora too, because it seems like a moment to take a step back and really think um, critically about what we are doing and um, how we define uh, what is the digital and uh, what is data and, and all the kinds of questions I hope that we will be able to address uh, this evening or morning, afternoon. Um, what we will do to begin, as Olivia mentioned, is uh, each of us will actually present very, very briefly for about five to seven minutes. Um, an introduction, uh, the instructions that we delivered to Nancy and Dipti were, were pretty broad. Uh, so uh, a kind of introduction to what you do, I suppose, and what brings you to this conversation. So I thought I would kick us off, and then I'm going to pass the mic, so to speak, uh, to one of my co-panelists. So again, each of us will talk for about five, seven minutes tops. Um, and once that's concluded, we will open up the conversation among the three of us um, uh, more broadly. 
So to begin uh, my own graduate training, uh, I completed my PhD in 2011, um, which seemed to be right at the moment that the digital humanities um, were just starting to gain steam. And for that reason, I didn't really have an introduction to uh, what we call DH as a graduate student. Uh, my introduction to this field, and I kind of put that in quotation marks, DH is, is not exactly a field, um, but it really happened by accident, as I expect um, what's the case for many of my generation, um, through chance encounters with a couple of humanities projects um, that uh, in this, these particular cases, use network analysis and network graphing. Um, and when I saw these, uh, pr the presentation of these digital humanities projects, um, that's when it, it clicked for me that I also had a data set um, and that I could use this data set uh, to map, uh, in this case, uh, manuscript painters who worked in the Mughal uh, Imperial Manuscript Workshop at the end of the 16th century. It would take a few more years before I knew exactly how to execute that because there are technical steps um, to learning uh, how to actually structure data, uh, how to clean data, and then to make it processable, I suppose, for um, visual, visual graphing. Um, and that I actually, that knowledge I really gained through, um, at, at least initially, the Getty funded, Getty funded Beyond the Slide Library Digital Art History Summer Boot Camp, that's a mouthful, um, that I did at UCLA in 2015 with Nancy Um, uh, So we actually, uh, I think we met there that summer. And out of that experience came a publication in 2017 um, called Workshop as Network. Um, and that was a special journal issue that was actually edited by another participant in uh, that program, Miriam um, Keenley. Um, and this experience altogether, the boot camp, uh, this network graphing project that turned into a publication really opened my eyes to the potential of that critical digital tools and approaches methods held for the discipline of art history. Um, and I just want to explain when I say critical, I mean um, in the sense that um, one is bringing a self-conscious attention to what is the digital, what it comprises, who underwrites and owns it, to whom is it accessible or inaccessible, and who and what it sidelines. Um, as opposed to opposed to using digital tools and methods uncritically, which is how many of us, myself included, often go about our day. So it was really the critical digital that I wanted to uh, tap into. At the same time, I observed, at least anecdotally, that critical digital tools and methods um, remained or seemed to be um, still marginalized in art history pedagogy. Uh, and this is what inspired me to, to offer a digital art history introductory course at Amherst College um, in fall 2020. And I should just make clear for those of you who's not, who are not familiar with Amherst College or the US educational system, um, this is a strictly undergraduate uh, institution. Um, so this is a course I offered um, only for undergraduates. Due, uh, due to the conditions of the pandemic, I taught this course entirely online and for a variety of other reasons the course focused on the collections of South Asian uh, art objects in our college museum which is known as the Mead Art Museum uh, which the majority of the class actually did not have physical access to so um, it was a remote class that was very remote from the objects we are studying. Um, we as a whole practiced a minimal computing ethos uh, we use as our primary digital tools, uh, Google Sheets, Microsoft Excel, OpenRefine, a data cleaning program, Palladio, and Tableau. Um, and the exercises I assigned the students were sometimes um, deceptively simple. So for example, uh, to refine the museum collection data set, uh, this was one exercise I, I asked them to do, to refine the museum collections data set to include only objects from South Asia. Um, so in searching for objects then from this data set uh, that included terms like India, students were introduced to the use of this term to describe things like ink, as in India ink. Um, also we, or they found uh, many, many 
um, objects that came up associated with Native American communities and makers. So the exercise, that's very, very, very kind of simple exercise, revealed to the students the colonial traces in our college museum's metadata, but more fundamentally, it demonstrated to them how museum cataloging produces the objects that we study and how digital tools and methods may offer a means for them to intervene in the digital cultural record. So from this point, the digital became, uh, for me, a much more urgent matter, and I became more committed to centering digital tools and methods in my courses. Um, my scholarly focus in this vein has shifted somewhat as well. Uh, so the theme of a special issue uh, of the International Journal of Islamic Architecture that I'm guest editing for 2025 is the urgency of the digital. And among the questions I hope this issue raises include, uh, what does it mean to investigate and design the built environment through a data-centric lens? How could and should computers and digital processes be used to reconstitute buildings, cities, landscapes, and built environments that have been destroyed, replaced, looted, or never excavated? How have digital technologies made previously hidden architectural histories of marginalized communities more visible? What are the costs and benefits of making information belonging or that once belonged to vulnerable and underrepresented groups publicly accessible? What do digital databases and archives play in the design and study of architecture in the Islamic world today? Who has access to these materials and why? I could go on. These are just some of the questions um, that I hope um, the articles that are eventually published in this issue center. Um, but in short, my thinking now approaches the leveraging of the digital as something more like a five alarm fire. So I'll stop there. Uh, that's a just short uh, picture I've painted of um, where I'm coming from. And I'm going to uh, turn the platform over to Dipti uh, so she can introduce herself. Thank you, Yale. Um, hi, everyone. I'm so glad to be here and very excited to have this conversation with you all. Um, I uh, think it might be just easier for me to introduce the place where I work, um, tell a little bit about how I got there, and then a little bit about the projects that I work on right now. Uh, I'm a research assistant professor, as Olivia said, at the Royal Risen Spike Center for History and New Media which is the oldest digital history center um, in the United States. Um, we are a center within the Department of History and Art History at George Mason. So um, uh, we kind of work with other faculty members in the department, as well as students who come into the center as research assistants, graduate research assistants, and as, as well as undergrad students assistants. So a lot of my work, I do work with students, but within um, as, in a supervisory capacity in many different projects. So um, it is a center that really does uh, privilege teaching students by practice and being part of really nice projects. Um, and uh, most of them are grant funded uh, projects. And so students do get like a real life experience of what it is to be a digital humanist. Uh, I'm the only art historian at the center, which will come as no surprise to anyone here um, because there are so few of us um, around. And I'm also the only South Asianist um, there. And I work with um, my projects center on Indian textiles. But at the center, the way it's divided, I kind of work on uh, my projects as well as some of the other projects that I am a project director of. So, and I'll get to that in a bit. But my start with digital humanities, as Yale said, like, you know, I finished my PhD in 2020. And um, during my last couple of years, I started looking more and more at sort of the efficacy of the digital to communicate what, what we do with the public. I work on um, my dissertation was on the Malabar coast of southwestern India, which is um, and on 18th and 19th century wooden ivory objects that um, hardly anyone talked about. So uh, for me, it was very important to communicate what I was learning about and the history of these objects and of, you know, sort of the experience of um, artisans who made them often from lower caste communities with actual communities within um, the region 
And that was possible through, you know, sort of public work. And so that is where I got started. So I, I did a lot of public facing writing. I also did a lot of public facing talking um, over, over digital medium because I was in the United States and the community who were interested in what I had to say was in India. Um, and um, I also did a lot of podcasting work. So it is through sort of public facing digital projects that I got into DH and then um, I got a postdoc at the center and then I kind of transitioned into a professor position um, this past year. Um, and at the center, I work on three different projects. Um, one of them is a, a project that I work on for the Smithsonian um, and the other two are my own projects. Um, this, and I'm going to start explaining the Smithsonian project because it's probably the easier one to explain. Um, and that in that project, what we're doing is the Smithsonian's Office of Strategic Partnership and the National Museum of African American History and Culture have um, started this pilot project to bring um, the rich archives for, uh, from both archives and museums located within historically black colleges and universities, HBCUs um, in the United States and to make them digitally accessible for the broader public. And uh, this is a, a 20 year long project for them and we are involved in the pilot and at uh, Mason at the center, what I do and my team does is to um, train, plan, manage the project, uh, both about 60 people within five different HBCU units uh, located in five different states um, and um, train them to use content management system called Omega S where uh, the project lives, but also to help them um, talk about objects um, in like public friendly ways, how to design metadata, how to develop them, how to digitize and preserve, how to prioritize digitization, and so sort of the gamut. It's like um, it's from dig digitization to preservation to metadata production to um, public facing work, right? So uh, the the whole project of the the project is centered around capacity building and getting more diverse people into DH um, within cultural institutions. Um, my own projects are slightly different and more um, sort of uh, oriented towards um, uh, using DH towards original scholarship and research. And one of them is called Connecting Threads, um, which is uh, a, a, pro a collaborative project um, that has five institutions, Mason, uh, where I represent that project and is a PI, and then University of Edinburgh, where my other PI sits. And we have, we have partnered with VNA Museum um, Hooper Hewitt Museum in New York and uh, the University of Glasgow Archives to look at the history of striped and Czech textiles uh, that were produced in 18th and 19th century Southern India and then um, exported uh, across the globe. But particularly within the project that we are currently working in, we are looking at its uh, production by lower caste weaving communities in Southern India and then its use by free and enslaved people um, uh, from black communities in the greater Caribbean region. So essentially when these textiles are usually talked about, they're talked about as an export material and often seen from like an Euro-American mercantile network lens. And our project is to kind of reorient and think about global South-South exchanges where the Euro-American uh, merchants are still, and traders are still a part of that conversation, but they're not always the agent, agents within these interactions. So the project is to kind of um, change the way we are looking at uh, the consumption, the production and consumption of these textiles. Um, and uh, this is where original digital scholarship is happening. This is supposed to be a bond digital project. So what we're doing is we're using new digital, designing new digital infrastructure, um, using computational analysis um, to make sense of the data we collect. And of course, we're going to use them uh, when we eventually get a project of visualizations and um, drawing inferences from the data we have. Um, the other project that I work on is also on textiles, but basically that one is what I call my guinea pig project, <laughs> where I'm kind of throwing methodological questions at this project. So I look at 300 chintz textiles that are in three North American museum collections. And I look at both metadata and the textiles themselves. And basically um, the idea is to ask what does um, using digital tools and methodologies do for the field of art history? What, can, what questions can the DH answer that other methods of inquiry within its art history that's already existing and already established 
um, does not. So the idea is to heuristically kind of look at what is, um, what can big data, and I hate using that word, but to differentiate it from other ways of looking at knowledge production um, in the field, like what does that do? What happens when you don't look at just four or five textiles? What happens when you look at 300 textiles or metadata of 300 textiles together? What kind of questions can that answer? So basically all the three projects I work on kind of look at different parts of digital history or digital art history and digital public art history. And I'm happy to talk more about that in our um, sessions. Um, Nancy? Hey, thank you. So hi, everyone. It's such a great pleasure to be here this evening, calling in from Los Angeles, and to join all of these colleagues from um, around the world. I'd like to uh, thank counterparts at the University of Sydney, Olivier, Nick, Alex, and Pavand for this very generous invitation to participate in the Sydney Asian Art Series again, um, and uh, also for planning this event. And of course, thank you so much, Yael, for um, uh, bringing me onto this panel. In fact, it's really uh, just a great pleasure, extremely happy to join Yael and Dipti. Um, because we're really continuing conversations that we've had. Perhaps we haven't had them all in the same room at the same time, but I've definitely had versions of this discussion with both of you, really just asking to me what I think is a fundamental question of what it means to be a 21st century art historian, right? And, um, you know, for me, that's the kind of essence of this uh, discussion. And so I'm thrilled that we can continue this thread here online with all of these other interested colleagues. Um, so, uh, yeah, I will just start the way that Dipti did and just say a few words about myself and how I got into digital art history. And I really think it's important to share these kind of origin stories um, because it's really clear that there's not one single path or on-ramp to digital art history. And I think we have to kind of talk about the many ways in which we all enter um, because we I, I do need to lower some of the perceived barriers to entry to this field. Um, and hopefully make it seem a bit more welcoming uh, so that it can continue to grow. And um, so, you know, you just heard from Dipti who described um, this great role that she's playing um, at uh, George Mason involved in these major public facing projects. And she only told you a few of them. In fact, she's involved in a lot more that she didn't share with you. So she just saw a small slice of that. And indeed those projects are amazing with large teams of collaborators often undergirded by a lot of grant money and the kind of structure of a center like um, the Center for History and New Media at George Mason. Um, but unfortunately, not all of us have the opportunity to have that kind of training. And in fact, um, you know, someone like me, I was, I've never been part of a major digital project, even though I've, you know, had the uh, benefit of consulting on a few. Um, I spent most of the formative years of my career on a campus that did not have any infrastructure for digital humanities, didn't have a digital humanities center. And I consider myself to be a relative latecomer to digital art history. Yale already gave you a little bit of my origin story when I met her at the Getty um, workshop many years ago, actually about a decade, was it about a decade ago, even less than that, eight years maybe. Um, and um, you know, that was for me a moment when I had you know, already settled into a very established research practice. And by the way, I am an, um, I am an Islamicist. I work on the Indian Ocean. I also do a lot of work in South Asia as well. And I kind of thought I knew who I was by that point, but um, the kind of awareness of digital art history really shifted things for me. And so when I became, I think like Yael, very captivated by the possibility of digital methods, kind of seeing things that really started to make sense to me about kind of questions that I felt like I couldn't answer, things I couldn't do, um, I, you know, started to kind of very... Um, uh, avidly take lots of workshops, some of them in person, some of them online, a lot of them which I never finished, I will say, as a bit of a confession. And I took this really kind of meandering path, very much self-directed. And I would say that I think my work in digital art history kind of reflects that in that I, um, it's quite kind of broad, not very deep in many ways, and that I just tend to dabble in various methods, right? I don't have this like particular set of technologies that is, you know, what I specialize in, um, but, you know, have worked in data visualization, mapping, um, social network analysis. And if I were to kind of describe what my biggest and most enduring critical interest is, it would probably actually be oriented around the profession, the profession of being a digital art historian. Like, what does that look like? How do we make that? How do we perpetuate that? How do we support that? These kinds of questions. 
So my, you know, I guess real contributions, if I would have to enumerate them or would, you know, have to kind of describe them in this way, would be really oriented towards service and advocacy as kind of really important components of this rising set of practices. And so in terms of what that really looks like, um, you know, it, by in my previous position, um, I spent 20 years at Binghamton University as a faculty member and an administrator. Um, and there I really worked to try to build communities of practice of digital humanists, digital art historians. Um, and, you know, that kind of work, which is really programming, program building work. I do want to underline it's really much more about people than it is about machines, right? Even though machines <laughs> kind of play a role in that. Um, uh, you know, it entailed connecting humanists across departments, building bridges between humanists and data scientists, computer scientists and engineers. Um, you know, those bridges sometimes can be challenging to build in robust ways. Um, and most importantly for me, collaborating very deeply with librarians who were my closest partners in all of these program building endeavors. And so those programmatic initiatives, I think, are the ones that I'm perhaps the most proud of, um, even though that work in some ways was very int intangible, right? The efforts were very dispersed. Um, one thing that did come out of it um, is that I designed an interdisciplinary minor in digital and data studies in Harper College, where, um, again, I taught for many years. Um, and unfortunately, the minor launched after I left for my current position. So I never got to see it in place as a faculty member, but I am told that within its first year, uh, since its launch, it has now 250 minors, which is pretty good, I would say. Um, and really does give me a sense that this impulse that computational liberal arts, that this kind of set of questions and skills um, are captivating to a rising set of students who kind of think in certain ways that are facilitated by some of the tools that we provide and the ways of thinking and kind of entry points that come out of the digital humanities and digital art history. So that's really exciting. But all of that leads me now to my current role as Associate Director for Research and Knowledge Creation at the Getty Research Institute. And this is the position that I'm just settling into. I've been in for less than a year. Um, but I'm very fortunate to oversee a division that includes five departments, including the GRI's major digital initiatives. And these include the Getty Vocabularies, which is the leading authority resource in the visual arts and cultural heritage, which plays a major role in cataloging and metadata creation. Um, it, I also work with the Getty Provenance Index, which is um, truly a big data project and one of the earliest ones um, that uh, compiles and presents um, uh, large masses of information about the acquisition, movement, and transfer of art objects, and particularly Western paintings. Um, and uh, the other department is digital art history, um, and this is a department that is devoted to innovative research using digital tools and technologies. And so, um, you know, in some ways, I'm just still kind of getting and settling into the shift. I'm now no longer working with faculty or teaching um, or training students, so that's a, a big change. Um, but I'm really lucky to work with a very talented team of dedicated colleagues who all have a great amount of expertise in digital art history. And Dipti um, uh, brought up this kind of notion of, you know, what it means to be the only art historian, right? Um, you know, uh, that is uh, among a kind of crew of other people who are um, really devoted to different disciplines. I mean, so I'm, I think, quite fortunate and quite unique in having lots of colleagues who um, are very much engaged in this area. And um, I would say that the digital initiatives as a group are working toward a few ends now, which are, again, very different than the ones that I think I was thinking about in my previous role. Um, we are engaging in and disseminating the findings of research projects that have the potential to shape art historical practice rather than just using digital tools, right? Really thinking about how these instruments are fundamental to the core questions of art history. We are working to promote a sense of awareness and a deliberate engagement with te the technological underpinnings of the discipline of art history with the understanding that technology is central to art history, not external to it. And I'm working in an archival and library context. You can see the parts of the photo archive of the Getty, at least in my kind of fake background behind me. Um, and uh, really uh, one of the main questions that we are asking are uh, how we can promote ways to conduct art historical research that is sustainable, ethical, and inclusive, but while also taking full advantage of the many shifts that are continuing to be dynamic and 
digital imaging and information delivery. So what about, you know, the kind of bigger ecosystems within which we work? And so those are the questions that animate my current practice. And maybe we should open this up. What do you think, Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Thank you both for the introductions. It, also because they really helped to flesh out the multiple pathways um, through our shared fields uh, that we have, you know, we, we've all walked, but also um, the kind of multi-institutional, the range of institutions and collaborators that, um, that both of you have worked with and continue to work with is really remarkable. Um, I wanted to actually just start in a way with some basic terms um, and the way that we think about terms like data. When I am in the classroom with my students and we are talking about argument, constructing argument, uh, you know, I'm inclined to ask where there's a weak point in argument, you know, what is their evidence? We talk about evidence, we, um, and use other related terminology. Um, what does it mean to start to bring data into, I mean, semantically and then literally into the picture? Um, so yeah, what does it mean to bring data um, into our history and where does it fit? Well, maybe should I just jump in here, Dipti, with a few things? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I'm, I mean, I think, well, you know, we've been operating under the uh, illusion that we don't deal with data, I think, in art history, right? And, um, you know, I think I, I'm pretty sure that all three of us believe that we all have data, that images are data, that, um, you know, a lot of all of the information that we work with is data, even if it's not structured, right? But definitely that kind of having structured computer actionable machine ready data, and it brings us into a different realm of thinking where we have to tangle with numbers fundamentally, which art historians don't like to do. And we have to tangle with machines, right? Um, depending on how big the scale gets, right? And so, for me, you know, I think the first thing is dispelling again that delusion that we don't have data because we all have data. We've got to manage that data, right? You know, and I think a lot of our concerns deal with the data management problems of their very unruly hard drives, for instance, and they feel like that's, you know, but they don't see it as a data management problem. They just see it as a kind of problem of the messiness of their computer, right? But, but right. Um, you know, we have, we all have data. We all have data problems. Um, but then there's also the other side of it, which is the potential that if we begin to work with our data in ways that are structured and that we can begin to query in really interesting ways and kind of draw patterns out of, um, you know, I feel like that's kind of what lit up all three of us because we mm -hmm. saw what we could do when we began to work intensively with data-driven methods, with the quantifiable um, and uh, yeah, but, you know kind of brought us to a different level that brought us here today, no? Yeah, I, I, I completely agree uh, with uh, the way Nancy kind of plays that so beautifully. But um, in my mind, as I have worked with, like, and I've gotten increasingly comfortable over the last three years saying data set, um, in, in which way my, my Indian parents who wanted me to be an engineer and I resisted with all my you know, life and guts, <laughs> you know, for, for a long time, they would be surprised with how easily I can say data set now. Um, <laughs> but the, the idea of data set for me in my mind is always associated with something that is machine readable. So in my mind, like, you know, it's the same as Nancy said, every, all our historians have data. It's just in what form are we manipulating data or, you know, um, thinking about that information. So um, textually, if it's if it's human-based, we kind of think, we think of knowledge systems or information, or, uh, you know, we talk about, you know, crit it, cr you know criticism or, uh, crit it, you know, sort of uh, argumentative thinking or however we want to talk about it. But the minute I say data, I immediately, my brain has been now wired to think, okay, I'm using some kind of a tool to make sense of this large amounts of information that would be better processed with the help of a machine 
than just on my own. Um, and that's how I have differentiated it in my head. That makes a lot of sense to me. It's there's if I could just connect a thread between um, comments that both of you gave. There's a there's a way that were I to build a course as art and information or machine readable. Well, actually, take machine out of there. But art and information, um, I might get some healthy enrollment. But if it were art and data, right? So there there is this work that data. Um, on multiple levels is also doing that I think all of us are aware of. Um, so I, I actually agree with both of you. Uh, but there's this this funny way that I think within the discipline it becomes or it, it gets kind of suppressed um, and yet can be used in these selective ways to sort of beef up the topic. Um, so it becomes kind of saleable as in this kind of, you know, machiney scientistic -y way um but you know but Donald, I was also, of, yeah sorry go ahead, I was gonna say yeah. that one of the issues though I would say and this is a kind of a humanist issue right is that yeah I think so many of us have had data weaponized against us right and you yeah. know I'm no longer teaching in a university but of course I remember those days when I would you know kind of um be have to talk to an administrator about the fact that the enrollments in art history, you know, they would be, you know, they would give me a graph and the line would just keep on going down, right? You know, those kinds of things, right? Or, you know, questions about how long it's taking for some of the graduate students in our program to finish their degrees and that line would just keep going up, right? You know, those kinds of ways in which we often have been on the receiving end of what all of that quantification looks like. And it's been kind of weaponized mm -hmm. against us to make the case against mm -hmm. the humanities. That's why it's mm -hmm. so exciting to then kind of take those same tools and to be able to mm -hmm. mobilize them on our own terms and to be able to present them to make arguments on behalf of the humanities, showing the, you know what I mean? And to kind of show the value of the work that we do rather than to just be on the receiving end of that declining line <laughs> down that's, you know, that is, um, you know, in many ways meant to um, uh, kind of serve as evidence of our, uh, you know, of our irrelevance in many ways, no? That, that just really makes, that makes it yeah, then that makes a lot of sense. Um, sorry to jump in, Yale. Like, yeah, I have please. sense like <laughs> when when I present to art historians, I um, sense I mean not not in just art historians, but more traditional minded historians also that when I say data, there is a resistance. Like you know, there is it is in it is incredibly more difficult to make the case for the work I do when I use the word data. Um, with certain certain subsets of uh, people within the humanities, and and I wonder, if, Nancy, it's because of the associational data with all these other kinds of like you know data's never been a friend but a foe, um, and mm -hmm. I wonder if that's the case because I always feel like uh, my first job as someone who works in DH is to kind of go in and educate about my work in ways that can reduce the resistance to using computational tools um, and and I think that's something that we need to kind of discuss as a group as you know how how that can be um, how, how to manage that kind of resistance against the digital in the field mm -hmm. or if you actually feel that too like you know or it's just me. I absolutely feel it um there there's a real kind of antagonism um or fear and anxiety around, I think, um, this kind of language. And, and I think I think Nancy has in part hit the nail on the head. Um, and it's I, it must be a particularly acute uh, if you don't actually have the the tools, the means, um, the skill to to <laughs> I was gonna say weaponize, but actually um, to to use it yourself. Uh, not necessarily to weaponize. Yeah, and I know we weren't supposed to start talking about AI in our first uh, right now, but I will say that right now, the moment of kind of hysteria, yeah. a feeling like we're so at the kind of, um, you, know, I, you know, I think that there's a lot of hysteria rather, right? And just feeling very, a lot of anxiety, some of it very well-founded, I want to say, but, you know, but surely, but but um, but really this sense of powerlessness in terms of a technology that's moving out of control, like literally kind of with no human intervention, 
um, I think is very pervasive now that we have um, so much discussion in the public sphere about technologies that have been long in the making and have been around and are, you know, and have been used, I think, for, you know, for uh, longer than I think most people are acknowledging. But at the same time, you know, we're really, I think, in a kind of place where, where, um, you know, uh, there are like kind of lines being drawn in the sand. Um, and so it's hard to make the case, right, for technology when I, for, let's say, for the need to engage with technology, right, when, um, when I think there's so much fear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have more questions actually about big data, but maybe we should move on in the interest of time. Uh, maybe these issues will come up in a bit, um, but maybe we could segue actually to museums and collections. Um, all of us have worked in some capacity very closely, uh, less closely with these institutions. Um, 50 with your uh, multi-year project, um, the Connecting Threads project. Uh, my understanding is, is, you know, you're partnering with a variety of museum institutions and the idea being that you uh, and your collaborators will share uh, the findings from this project. Um, I am curious to, to hear from both of you about where you see um, digital art history and and these th this kind of work sort of intervening. And I think it's a particularly interesting question since none of us, although Nancy, you work adjacently to a, a very large museum, but none of us is actually working in the capacity as a, as a curator or any of the other um, numerous specialists who who actually care for objects in, in museums. Um, so how our work is going to your work is going to um, sort of intervene um, in those places. Nancy, should I start? Go ahead. Um, so, museum, <laughs> the museum, I, I take a deep side because museum and museum metadata have been like, become like a thing that I dream about in, in mm -hmm. when I sleep these days because I've spent so much time trying to make sense of them and how to kind of work with museum metadata. Um, one of the problems, and this is everybody who's worked with uh, museums um, and trying to use museum information catalogs or um, data for DH digital um, scholarship, um, digital analysis, uh, it's very familiar that the museum metadata, even when they are in graphs and charts and downloadable in CSVs or spreadsheets or whatever, um, they are not DH friendly. They are not um, structured, even though they look structured, they're not really structured to be used for computational analysis. So a lot of the time when I go in and download metadata from the Met or from uh, the Royal Ontario Museum or um, from Winterthur, which, which are all the partners I work with on my Chins Textile project, um, what I get is a set of a messy group of information that A kind of shows you sort of the um, layers of the history of collecting um, the epistemology of museum collections, right? And how convoluted it is, and also the colonial underpinnings of that, that becomes very clear very quickly once you start sort of parsing through that metadata. But then to make sense of that, both as an art historian and as a person who wants to do computational analysis with that work, it's a, it's a, it's a hefty task and it takes a lot of time. Um, what we need is, I mean, I can, I can make those interventions in like, you know, my projects, but what we need is sort of a collective decision within, um, with art historians, curators, other museum professionals to come together and say, we need to kind of think that we're in 2023 and we need to make metadata, you know, the methods of collection and the methods of preservation of data within museums updated for the 21st century, which it isn't. It's still following the same system that I guess the Smithsonian set up in 1848 when the first National Museum of Natural History was set up. Um, I think it's the same thing. So, I mean, if the library systems have up upgraded from cards and like card catalogs, you know, the museums have done that by just sort of reproducing those catalogs in a computerized manner. And that is not helpful. Um, and so it is, it is something of concern because if we, the amount of time that you have to spend in tidying data, you know, to use that word, um, it's also a moment where we as art historians and as, you know, people who work with the museum curators included, everybody can 
talk about decolonizing that information because there's a lot of what you see is like you know layers of um, colonial ways of collecting, colonial ways of preserving data, um, uh, language um, that's used that has you know decades of um, imbalance kind of inequities kind of built into it. And so this is the moment that we can actually have start having those conversations on how to truly sort of decolonize museums through its metadata. And I think that's something that um, I have been giving a lot of thought to as I've worked with metadata in the last couple of years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think we're just at this moment where, you know, um, and I, I don't know exactly when it happened, the kind of turn to openness, right, in terms of um, museum uh, collection data, right, and just the abundance like, I mean, it's so funny because I feel like as art historians and for me working, you know, um, uh, on the Indian Ocean, working in Yemen, I'm always kind of complaining about not having enough material scarcity, right? And loss, right? You know, uh, we, you know, we've lost this building. We don't know what it looked like. We've lost these records. We don't, you know, we don't, we don't have them anymore, right? So on one hand, you know, I think our research for many of us is kind of oriented around narratives of loss. But then when it comes to collections data, I think that we're like, oh my God, there's like the abundance is just like, has is kind of, out of control right now, right? For any, you know, more than one, you know, more than, than than researchers can even kind of get their heads around, right? In terms of the growing scale of what's available to us in some cases with just, you know, um, kind of a pretty uh, easy, pretty easy access point uh, as Deepti was mentioning. Um, and, you know, I've been thinking about this a lot because, you know, we're dealing with lots of questions about like infrastructure and systems right now in terms of um, the work that I'm doing um, in my current position and, thinking about, you know, all of these problems, even internally about multiple systems that don't talk to each other and multiple, um, you know, kind of multiple cataloging standards and how, you know, and how even in a single institution, we might not even be able to resolve this, right? And so if you're thinking about cross-institution, it gets increasingly, increasingly challenging. Um, but I just think we have to acknowledge, and this is where I think this question of intention is really important. You know, who is that metadata for? Okay, because it was produced by a cataloger so that they could catalog the object, right? And I think it was really produced for a user because, in fact, it probably when that when that you know collections data was put together, it wasn't assumed that someone would have access to that material from a, some kind of portal and that it would actually be turned and inverted to an audience outside of it, right? Um, so you already have this kind of cross purpose of the cataloger kind of thinking internally about what that object, the role of it that it plays inside. The institution and then the inversion to some kind of user who knows what their intention is coming to that database right and then there's this third layer that that you've just brought up Dipti, which is that of someone who wants to use that collections material as data who's thinking about all of that information in a completely different way and wants it to look completely different right and so um while i'm certainly commiserating with you i just feel like wow there's all this pressure on what you know what is that? What is it supposed to look like? Who is it supposed to serve? And um, and I feel like kind of that, those are the problems that we're, you know, I think we're not certain about, right? Because those, as all, you know, as openness has kind of changed, as soon as you can public access points to material that was meant to really be closed and was not meant for an audience. And as people are using all these new tools that, you know, likely didn't exist when a lot of this data was produced, I'm, you know, we're, we're um, Gosh, I don't know why I sound like I'm like feeling sorry for the for the metadata right now, but you know, but it, but it's like there's all these pressures on it, right, about what it's supposed to mean, and so that's why you know, so th that's where the struggle comes from, right? Um, you know, mm -hmm. so. Well, I think just as we understand that museums serve different purposes, and we hope that they fulfill different functions than they did, say, in the 19th century right? Um, catalogs and metadata, as I think both of you have opened up, are doing something similar, right? They, just as Nancy said, that they're, they're serving different constituents, um, you know, but who is calling, except for, you know, Ditti here, for the decolonization of metadata, decolonization of um, the very sort of information structures that um, that order uh, and reify, right? In many cases, um, certain kinds of biases yes. and and hierarchies yeah. that are rendered kind of invisible, right? Um, 
And so I see that the institution and the collection and organization of information as, as kind of analogous, but, um, and they both have their kind of insidious colonial roots mm -hmm. as well. So they have that, they're, they're kind of siblings in, in, in common in that kind of way. Um, but yeah, I don't think we'll necessarily answer it in this session, but it, but it is about, I think, you know, um, who's going to listen, who is this information necessarily for? Um, is this just a complete sort of sea change and mindset that needs to actually occur within the institution of the museum? Right, because I've sat in that seat. I was a curator, you know, mm -hmm. I was sitting there with a data, you know, a digital database, mm -hmm. the museum system, TMS, which many, many museums um, in the United States use. And mindset, my mindset was I'm the expert and um, I am to come up with, uh, you know, the metadata, the description, the information about these objects that was the most accurate. I wasn't actually thinking about, um, you know, for whom then? Well, and I will say so, like, yeah. yeah, we're like, we're in this moment where I think institutions that prided themselves on being entirely opaque, mm. I won't name any, but <laughs> um, are trying to demystify themselves right now, or, or rather are being pushed to demystify themselves, right? And so we're really at this very kind of different moment. And, um, and so we're, you know, kind of pulling down some of these walls and kind of looking at um, some of these structures that I think, you know, deeply embedded, right? Before we run out of, I mean, we're not going to run out of time just yet. We are going to actually transition to an even more open conversation, taking questions from um, our audience. Um, I did actually, I just want to squeeze in one more question for both of you. I think it kind of naturally follows, falls um, uh, from what we were just discussing, which um, has to do with teaching, uh, which Nancy, I know you're still deeply invested in, even if you're not teaching students. Um, at least in a, a kind of formal um, university environment at this moment. Um, but, you know, to my mind, I think this is where the students who take my courses might see a, a really kind of fulfilling career path, um, which would be to go into the digital um, technical side of art history. Um, I want my students, I want, those are the people I want working in these museums um, who have taken courses with us. Uh, and um, and others of our colleagues. Um, so Ditti, maybe you could speak to that a little bit. Um, you know, have you started to kind of think about how your teaching is is inflecting, or um, how the digital is kind of inflecting, and and how you're now kind of um, intervening in uh, the classroom with these kinds of new approaches? So um, the good news with for me is that you know Mason's uh, Department of History and Art History have multiple digital history courses that they teach. They have taught it for the last 10, 15 years. Um, and um, at both the undergrad and the grad level, I'm actually teaching the grad seminar um, on the applied history course, it's called next fall, um, which is um, um, basically thinking about visual and material culture um, and using digital tools to either talk about them or how to use visual and material culture when you're doing digital projects. So, you know, it can be either way, it's a project-based course um, for both history and um, art history grad students. Um, so in, in the way Mason's department is set up, it sort of digital teaching is inbuilt into these courses. Um, where I find it most useful, and a lot of these students who are interested in DH also um, work on live projects at the center, as I mentioned before in my introduction. So from the experience of actually watching students, grad students especially, um, come through the center, work on different projects, learn, um, you know, not just uh, DH, but managing projects, working with people, working in collaborative setups, they actually are so well placed to go out uh, after their PhD program or their master's program, and even some of the undergrad students to actually work in real time in museums, in other cultural institutions, in ways that most humanity students are not prepared. And so um, in, in some ways, the way I think of um, teaching these um, is through practice. Like, you know, I think we have to have 
a practice oriented pedagogy brought into the humanities in ways that I don't think is, at least in the United States, is practiced um, at present. And that would include kind of thinking about how can any professor bring that into their classrooms um, in any small ways. Um, and um, that that's again, something else that we need to kind of think about when we think about, I mean, DH cannot just happen on, a, on the side. It's part of their training. We need to bring that into every single course in every single classroom. And that's sort of the mentality with which I have sort of approached uh, teaching in the last uh, few years that I have been doing Amazing. this. Amazing, yeah, Nancy. Yeah, so I mean, I, I kind of would take this on two levels, right? I think there's kind of, um, you know, as Dickie was just saying, you know, kind of, you know, teaching digital humanities methods, teaching computational approaches, having people become, having students really become um, immersed in a set of myth methodologies, super important, super fulfilling. And, you know, I think it's kind of life changing for a lot of students. But I guess what kind of keeps me up at night and, you know, yeah, you mentioned at the beginning, you know, you, some of your urgencies and your, uh, you know, and, and your kind of sense that like, you know, we've really got to maybe push on this a little that you know, we've got to push on this in ways that we haven't previously. I mean, you know, I think that what's at stake now, though, are things that are a lot more basic in the way that we're training students and graduate students as well. I think basic data literacies, I think, are really, really important that, um, you know, uh, that kind of logic, um, I think it's being lost and it's not being taught in a lot of humanities classrooms. And that's really dangerous, I would say. Um, you know, I would say for art historians and anyone in any humanistic field to really understand the digital platforms that are actually delivering all of their information is so, so important. Um, you know, um, I, I think it's really, it's really challenging for a student to say, you know, like, you know, for instance, when I was in my old position, I had to deal with a lot of the unfortunate plagiarism cases in my college, right? And I realized a lot of them were not about students cheating or plagiarizing, is that they simply did not understand the mechanisms that they were delivering their information. And they were like, I don't know how to cite an edited volume because I don't really even understand what an edited volume is because I've never seen the book. I've only seen parts of it. So how can I understand, you know, where this chapter, can, you know, this kind of question of like yeah. the structure of information and also the very distinct way in which it's delivered to us. These platforms, I think we, um, we as scholars struggle sometimes to figure out how to maneuver them, right? Uh, you know, in our own systems. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we spend as much time as we need to really convey to our students why they look the way they do and why even, let's say, an archival database might look the way it does. And the things that Dipti was just uh, critiquing about museum databases and, and yeah, that you were just critiquing, mm -hmm. you know, why, why that structure looks the way it does and why that is carried over into a kind of delivery interface. Those are fundamental questions that I worry that we're not doing enough with. And so that context of understanding is really, really being muddied. Um, and I don't know how we can get to doing the advanced research, to asking the big questions if we don't understand that structure of delivery mm -hmm. of information, how it's formatted, what its affordances are, um, the ways in which it's been, you know, both kind of hampered by previous technologies, but also open to other kinds of problems and biases, right? You know, so, so in some ways, I think that might be the urgency, like digital humanities, mm -hmm. I would, you know, I'd love it if we could bring it into every campus and make sure that all students who are getting degrees in the humanities, if they could have exposure, mm -hmm. because I think it's worthwhile, but that kind of more fundamental understanding about the technological world in which we're operating, I feel like is so crucial. And that's also absent, unfortunately. Well, I think the variety in your responses that I'm hearing, um, it of course speaks to the different kinds of institutions where the two of you work and have worked. And um, in Dipti's case, it's like a dream to be part of a department yes. where digital history has been taught for over 10 years, where you have students taking multiple courses in yeah. these areas and so you can really stretch the limits of what you can do i imagine with your students yes um because they're already coming to your classroom with um beyond basic digital literacy um in other places and this includes my own institution we don't have a dh center um we have tons and tons of computer science majors some of whom end up double majoring in art history um but the humanities digital thing is is really still kind of like coming together um i think about these 
other kinds of uh, issues, uh, the sort of the lowest level, kind of lowest common denominator, um, you know, information um, skill set that uh, my students may need. And this is why, um, and I, I kind of invoked it in my own little introduction, I really, really love uh, Rubik Arisam and Alex Gill's um, uh, recent, um, it was a, actually a, a journal introduction um, that they co-authored uh, on minimal computing. And it's really powerful coming from um, two pretty big digital humanists. Rupa Grissom is at Dartmouth, Alex Gill's at Yale, um, who, you know, both know how to code. They, they've got the chops, but um, here they are, you know, taking this platform um, to really speak to uh, computing minimally, <laughs> that all around um, in the classroom and beyond. Um, I think this is how, you know, if, we, if we're going to sort of proselytize here, which, you know, maybe we are, this is how we're going to bring our students and others into the fold. Um, minimal computing, of course, meaning, you know, sort of um, in a way kind of out of the box digital tools. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to add to that, that, you know, all, I mean, as three, um, people who are working within the North American education system or cultural system, mm -hmm. we are has a very Western academic perspective. And um, as someone who works with histories of the global South and, you know, have to, uh, I mean, we all work with histories of the global South. We know that the resources that we talk about is a luxury in most places that we study. Um, and so when we actually come to the act, I mean, out just not just pedagogically practicing within classrooms, but in how to get the information that we all produce in digital forms out into, you know, places that are not the West. Um, also, and I think it was, uh, mm -hmm. I think Rupi Karusam and Alex Gill addressed this in their article, but like, you know, others have done it. Sonia Drummer has done it well about what is the least common um, or the most easiest basic output digitally that you can produce that is yeah. can be made available in places that are not the West, you know, whether on high speed internet is a problem, power is a problem, like, you know, we're talking about data literacy or visual literacy where any kind of literacy can be a concern. So, you know, how do we then use the digital not as like a barrier of entry, but like, you know, something that can reach beyond that barrier and that's an important question to talk about uh because for me at least the the reason why digital is exciting is because it can it takes the academy to the public we're not waiting for mm -hmm. students to just come into our classrooms we can take our classrooms to a broader public and um that's also important at least for me um especially because i think as humanists like staying out of social media and things and what is happening is like with the idea of this critical race theory discussions that happen there are a lot of armchair historians ready to this sort of like pounce and like you know take over the public uh dialogue about history and art and culture and um and the digital is the way that we can actually reintroduce some of that criticality that we work with in the academy and bring that out to a more public sphere um and so, and so how we do that and the basis by which we can do that is I think important to discuss as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I really I think that this whole question of, you know, I mean, you know, we have to also make sure that we manage our own enchantments with technology because those can become, you know, really yeah. problematic, you know. Um, and I, I think the minimal computing model in which we're, you know, we're done with the bells and whistles. We're asking questions about sustainability, about, you know, again, about accessibility, right, that are, that are, um, that I think are super important. But um, I mean, those cornerstones of why we do digital humanities work. I mean, for me, in some ways, it's like the technology is the second thing, right? You know, it's like the principles of openness, of focusing on audience, right? On collaboration, obviously, on the ability to think about process over product, right? All of these things I think are so core. Those were, though, that's what's quite captivating, I would say. And that's kind of what I think, you know, um, still drives me back to this work. Um, you know, even again with all the, all the hurdles, right, and obstacles. Um, uh, I think we should turn to uh, questions from our audience because there are many. Uh, I am going to summarize um, them. I will go one by one if that's okay. So the the first one, um, both of you can see them, correct? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Great. So um, the first one 
uh, is directed towards Nancy, but I, I think um, oh, uh, mm -hmm. Dipti could certainly address it as well. Um, and this had to do specifically, Nancy, with your previous role, um, you mentioned the lack of infrastructure. Um, and so the question has to do uh, more specifically with, you know, how, what did you do to overcome those challenges? What were actually the key challenges? Um, and this is a question that I think Dipti could speak to as well, which is um, when it comes to managing data, like cleaning and structuring data, what are the common problems specifically? Yeah. Trailing spaces. Nancy, do you want to kick us <laughs> off? Yeah. I'm sorry, I was just kidding. Um, so, yeah, yeah, infrastructure yeah. problems. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, again, if we get back to minimal, minimal approaches, you know, you don't need a lot of infrastructure, right? I mean, I think, you know, I, I mean, you can start off really small, you know, there's so mm -hmm. many tools out there, I think, for people who want to begin to do this kind of work. And, um, you know, I, I imagine, you know, um, love to talk to this uh, colleague from National Gallery of Singapore more and kind of understand what's, what's, what's going on uh, there institutionally. Um, but I would uh, direct uh, this person to the uh, collections as data um, resources. Those are really, really great. And there's a whole movement of collections as data, which really just kind of provide really, really good um, set of tools and guidelines and best practices for working with your collections data in ways that are responsible, sustainable, and um, you know, assuming as well that someone like Ditti is on the other end and wants to kind of work with them and, you know, uh, work with this material as a data set. Um, and, um, you know, so I would start there. I think that that material has been really useful and um, they've got a, a website and um, offer lots of tools that, you know, totally scalable, right? Lots of tools, some of which, you know, are open source and readily available, um, you know, and so that's always where I point people. I don't know, Ditti, is there anything else you would add to that? Yeah. I would just say that um, uh, to the person who asked the question that the it is a labor intensive process. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of um, um, energy. So it's not just learning the skill to do it, but actual number of hours that you take. And I don't have a solution to that as yet. But in the I'd like to put in a good word for AI here um, that you know some of it might have a resolution in the next five to 10 years because um, we, we've, been, we've been having generally going history about students using chat GPT and the like. But uh, for the Smithsonian project, we are beginning to talk about how we can cut down on the time that the teams need to take their existing archival metadata and convert that into a public facing metadata for a public history project. And they're taking a lot of time to do that, that kind of, you know, linguistic conversion. So um, in the next couple of weeks at the center, we are running a hackathon with all the center faculty and graduate students to see if we can use chat GPT to train chat GPT to do that work so that we can cut down a little bit of time and then we can train um, the HBCU teams to do the same because they, they are resource, uh, they're completely under-resourced and there's a lot to do. And so we're trying to make use of these kind of things to see if there's a way we can reduce the time. So those kind of things will become more common, I think, in the next five to 10 years. But in the meantime, I'm just plugging away in my metadata every single day. And there is no one easy solution, I think, for that. And applying for really <laughs> Yes, well, actually, that brings us to uh, this next question, which has to do with funding. Um, well, where does the funding come from? Uh, and and I guess the perception actually, um, you know, that is expressed in in this uh, the question that um, DH comes with a lot of or requires um, a lot of financial investment. Um, is that the case? Uh, and you know, where does this money come from? Who actually is funding these kinds of initiatives? Uh, my funding comes through the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Art Humanities, uh, Arts and Humanities Research Council, UK, um, and I've also been funded by other smaller organizations like the American Institute of Indian Studies. Um, but um, but it is it is currently the problem is that it is heavily. Um, at least in the US are dependent on government, government, federal government funding agencies 
um, and they fund very specific kinds of projects. So if you're in K through 12 education, if you're in school-based education digital projects, there's a lot more funding that you can get through non-federal um, organizations like the Ford and the Mellon. Mm -hmm. If you're doing social justice projects, Mellon is a big funder for those projects right now. Um, and those keep changing. Mellon was funding graduate student initiatives all this while, and they have just in the last year moved into social justice initiatives. And now they're funding a lot of digital social justice initiative projects. Mm -hmm. So um, so the funding streams keep changing. And yes, the, it's very volatile, if you ask me. And it's, um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it, it, it's it, it, impossible uh, yeah. to predict in yes. a way. Yeah, yeah you can't I game it so. necessarily. And, you know, I, and, you know, what does I think where the money is directed because so much of it is directed toward development of projects and not maintenance, right? And so the sustainability yeah. question is really huge, right? And, yeah. um, and uh, you know, what kind of institutional resources do you have to sustain a project, you know, and how long? I mean, not everything needs to live forever, right? So what's the plan for how long that this project is going to stay alive and who's going to maintain it? Who's going to pay for that? Um, and so, you know, it, it, it gets really problematic, right? Because mm -hmm. there's a, so many ambitious projects that, you know, really big projects, big, you know, big funding at the outset. Um, and then that kind of long-term strategy, right? You know, and I think, uh, the, yeah, it, it, it can be yeah. challenging. And, and well, I think the many... unsaid, yeah, sorry. sorry, sorry. No, no, go, go ahead, please. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say the unsaid um, part of this conversation is that, as a person who applies for grants now constantly, like, you know, that is labor, right? That goes on top and beyond the actually doing of the project, just getting those fundings, even if the funding is available, you know, getting those, they are highly competitive, but also that you're spending a lot of time writing these long applications, like, you know, big packets. Um, and, and so, um, yeah, managing that in itself is its own thing. Yeah. which a lot yeah. of institutions can't do because they don't have their own manage managers to branch managers and, and the like. Yeah, and you know, and on the other side, as someone who reviews a lot of grants, I would say that you also see too that it's, you know, some of the places that are very good at writing these grants, again, they're very good at writing these grants, right? You know, and so it is hard, I think, to yeah. start off if you don't have that infrastructure, right? You know, and so so there's, you know, so there are, kind of, I think, built in structural ways in which um, it's hard to get started. So, so mm -hmm. in, yes, it is a challenge. Yeah. So there are yeah, opportunities, a... surely, but there's challenges. Yeah. Right. Can, can you necessarily speak the language? Are you able to kind of craft a compelling justification for, um, you know, a large grant? Um, and to go back to an earlier um, comment that you made, Nancy, I mean, how many times have we seen like a page of links for digital projects you click and it's just sort of like broken? Mm -hmm. um, so I think sustainability for me is 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 a really big one. And I, and I often wonder, and this is at the kind of smaller scale, like at a small institution like my own, whether, for example, um, every, let's say, classroom project needs to be sort of freshly coded. Um, so I think in these cases, in a lot of cases, minimal computing is the answer um, for something along the lines of like what Diti and her collaborators are working on. Um, the out of the box solution is not going to fit. But uh, so anyway, that's that's those are my two cents for anyone who's listening that um, not every single digital project necessarily is um, needs, you know, a huge chunk of money uh, from the get go. I think that a lot of experimentation can happen, um, you know, with, again, uh, you know, out of the box solutions. And then if if it needs to go from there and sustainability, questions about sustainability should should come to the fore for sure. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next question then. Uh, and this has to do with um, access and so I'm actually just going to read part of this question now. This is actually coming from Pavond, um, who gave the wonderful introduction at the beginning. Um, and she's wondering if um, the panelists could take this thread a bit further, reflect on digital histories vis-a-vis -vis digital inequality and digital injustice, um, something that probably becomes especially contentious issue when thinking about digital repatriation, mm -hmm. among other possible pathways that this question can take. Um, thanks for that really, really important question. 
so yeah, digital inequality and digital injustice. There's no, I think, agreed upon language, speaking of non-agreements in, uh, in standards about how to deal with an object that has been repatriated and left your collection, <laughs> right? And I think, um, I can't remember, I can't remember if, if what what where I'd seen it might have unfortunately been like a Twitter thread where someone showed the different examples of 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 you know how different objects um, how they appear in the in the in the digital catalog after they've been repatriated and in some cases it's just like wiped in some cases it's something yeah, like that's right. no longer deaccessioned or right you know and so there's no agreed upon language about how you know one would deal with that particular scenario um, so I will say it is uh, something that's completely unresolved. Um, uh, there was a really interesting article in the um, debates on the digital humanities, uh, the most recent one that I think I would, uh, and I think Pavon, you'd be interested in it, in it um, about it. It, be, it, it, it was oriented around Islamic manuscripts and kind of talking though about how in some cases, digitization of stolen objects then is a kind of cleansing of the problematic history. And then it somehow by digitizing it makes that um, object then appear at least you know, in a way where, say, a collection would never, or you know, a museum would never buy an object that they knew was looted, where if it become, kind of becomes part of the digital record, that that somehow neutralizes that problematic history. I thought that was a really fascinating piece. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking about that myself, mm -hmm. in fact, um, and and actually specifically cases of uh, major major digitization projects, um, manuscript digitization projects that have been undertaken in Yemen by you know very well funded um, institutions and 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 so on and you know questions around you know for whom are these objects being digitized or preserved. Um, and the use of language and rhetoric like, you know, universal cultural heritage as, as another way to kind of wash um, what are, you know, genocides, uh, illegal um, sale, um, circulation of, of these kinds of objects. And um, so, yeah, digitization is, is not a, a sort of, you know, it's not the utopia <laughs> that Indeed. I think it's often yeah. yeah it's not a panacea it's it's not going to kind of fix everyone's ills it's you know I think I think to this um this one more aspect of that sort of um um you know so digital gatekeeping that happens you, institutions digitize things and then they don't make them publicly accessible they just stay within like you know paywalls or you know um and so if they're going to be, who, who are they for? Like Nancy's question about intention and audience come into play. And especially mm -hmm. if it's um, if it's like Western institutions that have all these collections of, uh, you know, um, and they, they kind of digitize, but not make them available. Then what's, what's what, what, is, what, what is the point of it? Um, the second part of that is, uh, I think this is being touched upon by many people. And it's a real problem where the digital is Anglophone. Um, it is for the English speaking audience for the most part. Um, there are transcribers, for example, is one of the softwares who are now trying to doing many other European languages, but that extends only to, you know, maybe five or six other languages um, uh, for, for transcribing documents, like, you know, as, as a tool. Um, but that, those are few and far between. And so if you're not from the English speaking world, even like programming languages, they're, they're in English. Uh, at the end of the day, you need to know English to understand what's uh, what the programming language, how the programming languages work. Um, uh, but even even the way we put out information. So for connecting threads, we have had to actively think about um, different groups of people uh, who are a constituent audience. And we think it's the diaspora, both who are South Asian and the Caribbean for this part of the project. So we are thinking about when we get to the portion where we can actually do visualization, fingers crossed, we'll get the grant for that. Um, we have to then think about, it's not just English, we have to think about Tamil, Telugu, which were the main weaving community languages of the people who were the weavers of these textiles. We have to think about um, Spanish, French, Dutch, um, which was spoken in the Caribbean region in addition to English. Um, we, as we expand the project, we are going to have more <laughs> people of various um, um, linguistic families who are, who are going to be constituent audience for the project. And then 
how do we make that accessible? And that requires additional funding to go back to the funding because you know we then need language experts <laughs> to, to make it truly accessible as a digital project. So those are really, so when we talk about digital equities, the inequalities is kind of like, you know, hiding behind, um, you know, the possibilities of the digital all the time. And, you know, it's not just about translating the content. Are you also translating the navigation? Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, because there's like a That's whole right. other level yeah. then of, yeah. you know, and so it's just like, I mean, it never ends. Right. And so it'd be a bit, but it becomes, you know, there, there's a point where the project becomes kind of no longer, uh, you, it can no longer be circumscribed as well. Right. So right. decisions have to yeah. be made. It's, it's beyond translation. Thanks both for opening that can of worms, which it is. Um, I'm and I, going I should just through. add to that, yeah, yes, that, you please. know, at that moment, uh, you know, a, a lot of you have pointed to the, you know, the ways in which Facebook was used to track looted artifacts or that people have used, um, uh, you know, uh, certain kinds of imaging to track the destruction of, uh, of archaeological sites and, you know, in war, war zones and things like that. It's all these kind of successes, right? And But you have to be really nuanced about it because there's so many other sides to that story, right? Mm -hmm. Right. This is the same technology, the same um, uh, platform that's also surveying those same places. Exactly. Um, so another question has to do with the pros and cons of ready access to um, the plethora of digital visual images. Um, and what that means, what happens in and during a, a core act of art historical analysis specifically when we're actually looking closely at an actual artwork. So I, I think in some, it, it's really a question about, you know, what does this, the, the sort of overabund the abundance, overabundance of digital images do? How does it impact um, how we come to grips with objects? Well, maybe we, should we start with the, a JPEG is not the actual thing, <laughs> that discussion? Or, you know, I mean, I remember once I, I, gosh, and I hope the author of the paper is not here on this call, but I will, I will try to anonymize it. I read, a, I, I reviewed a paper in which mm -hmm. the, um, the whole paper was about um, ceramics, um, you know, but, it, but it treated all, and it was doing some computer vision on all these different kinds of ceramics and, and kind of looking for some pattern, using pattern recognition. Um, but of course, all of these ceramics, some of them were like bowls that were like convex yeah. and, you know, and some of them were tiles. Super difficult like, to photograph. And I was just like this, you know, you're not talking about the object. You're talking about a JPEG of the object, which is two dimensional. The object is three dimensional. And, you know, it's, so we've got, you know, kind of issues of kind of what we're actually talking about, what we're actually look, looking at and what is actually being mobilized. So I would just kind of start maybe with that. I, I think... Um... I do think there is this um, fallacy, this this understand, this sort of understanding that because you can see things in high pixels, especially pages, I'm talking about 2D images, not 3D works, because 3D works, I think fundamentally people kind of understand it's some somewhere in the back of their mind that you know there's a real thing and this is the image, like you know, the, that that differentiation is still present. But I think where this question becomes relevant more is when it's two dimensional images, when they are paintings or like Mughal manuscripts are a good example. Like, you know, people are like, we can look at it in such great detail online. Why do we have to go see the little thing in person? Like, you know, the because the scale actually makes it feel more than it is, right? In When you're in person looking at a, the actual manuscript in its size and, um, this is this is this is going to be a continuous continuing problem with the digital like you know to to tell people that did, that what we have in the digital world is important for access but we also need to separate that from the reality of actually being with the object and that that presence makes a difference and this goes back to the earlier question about digital inequity as well like you know you can't use the presence of an object as repatriation i don't think digital repatriation can be a thing for the same reasons mm -hmm. because it's not the actual thing um and mm -hmm. i think um to kind of make that distinction as we move it's going to be a problem more and more especially with ai mm -hmm. um and uh, and everything that's going to come in the i keep yeah. thinking of the pope in the puffer jacket <laughs> photograph um yeah you know 
as as more and more reality kind of like collides with you know yeah. made reality like you know made make believe reality like you know we're going to have this problem and we don't have any answers to that yeah. and and we don't have yeah. the language yet i think to really cope yeah. with the range of synthetic media that is already circulating you know like mm. you know a reconstructed image of a building is different in its kind of not realness than a image that has been photoshopped and changed and altered which is mm. different than a synthetic image that has been generated from a dolly prompt right you know they're all kind of not real but in different ways and and i think that subtlety of language of to describe kind of what we're seeing and what what we're coping with i feel like we mm. lack the vocabulary and we definitely lack the art historical vocabulary i mean i think yeah. you know uh, in the, in you know media studies i think they're definitely much mm. much further along than we are but um, we haven't been able to to push our language forward to be able to cope with what's in front of us, I think. So my response to that question is, um, I'm not sure when we think we're looking at the actual artwork, we're actually even looking at the actual artwork because it's already, already mediated anyway, because you're obviously encountering this object in the setting of a museum or a library where it comes with a, a label and it's vitrine or it's in some other kind of um, kind of institutionalized setting. So um, that's my thought about that. I'm mindful of the time. Um, I'm not sure if, you know, I'm kind of waiting for um, Olivier to bring the sort of digital cane and, and drag us off the stage. Um, there, there are more is. questions, but <laughs> in the interest of time, um, should we, what should we do? Should we just wrap up and yeah, we're up for time, but what we will typically yeah. do is also keep these questions. So I'd like to thank those great. who have um, chimed in um, with these great questions, because it's something that we can also come back to. Um, and particularly, I think to follow up would be wonderful. Um, I just wanted to thank you all once again and thank our audience. Um, I think I, I hope that we can share this this conversation. I think there's a lot of different threads uh, to, to pull out, um, but I'm mindful of all your time as well. Um, and it's been wonderful to be able to pull this together across so many different time zones. And thanks so much, Yale, for suggesting this as a, as a kind of discussion that we could have um, at such an opportune time. Thanks thank for you. offering the platform. It's been great. Great. Thank you. Thank everyone. you so much for having us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Bye bye.